Amen. Well, we praise God and thank God for allowing us to be in his kingdom, to be a part of this wonderful, wonderful kingdom that we are a part of. He's a great God. And so we are by, by connection, connected to the greatness of God. That is in its own self, in its own way, an awesome place to be. So that's one of the L S elements and so forth that I am really glad about. Uh, we're, we're, we've been studying from Michael for four weeks, Michael chapter five for four weeks. And uh, we're uh, going to, God willing, wrap up our, our study today on the fifth week in this area uh, of the Messiah has come and, and will come. And I've talked about a, a lot of different angles, uh, hopefully not too much to make it too complicated, but hopefully in a way that benefits and, 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 and actually uh, inspires you to take further the understanding and analysis of what the kingdom of God uh, means to you and what God is working on in your life. I mean, we've got to be ready. You know, we're living in times where you just need to be ready for whatever pops up. Uh, and you need to have your, as a, as the songwriter say, your war clothes on. You need to have on the whole armor of God. And, uh, Ephesians chapter six gives us this description of you know, putting on the whole armor of God. You need the whole armor of God. You know, I can't overemphasize or or, or exaggerate the importance of that. And I, I really want the people of God to understand that as we can see what's going on in this time right now, uh, we whether it is an end of the cycle or whether it is an end of the whole uh, quote dispensation, which is another discussion, but uh, we need to have on the whole armor of God, regardless of which one is the, uh, is the, uh, the right description. I see a lot of sun hitting my shoulder here from somewhere. I don't know exactly how, but anyway, we praise God. We'll try to move that out of the way. So, but I'm about to end up blocking you or something. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, praise God. The point that we must understand is what he says in, in Ephesians chapter six is put on verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against the wicked, spiritual wickedness in high places. So this that discussion there certainly coincides with what the teachings are and what happens when we look at the reference to Micah and what these things actually point to, because it's really warning us of a great and impending danger that is on us and upon us when we start to wander away from the faithfulness and the word of God and the life of God. It's quite dangerous when that begins to become your pattern. You know, uh, keep your mind stayed on the, what does he say? I'll keep you in perfect peace in Isaiah. If you, if you keep your mind stayed or focused on him, encourage yourself to stay focused on the Lord, stay focused on the word. Or don't let the journey you've begun be interrupted. Continue on with that focus you have on the Lord. So, all right, to our text, Micah chapter five, uh, verse uh, one through four, our main text. And we'll, uh, uh, we might jump down and read one more text there. So, but this is the area we were in. So let's stay focused. Uh, now, therefore, uh, gather, now, th now gather thyself in the in troops, O daughter of troops, he that has laid siege against us, they shall smite the judge of Israel with the rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord. Mm. Wow, that's so much. Okay. In the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. For now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. For this man shall be the peace when the Assyrians shall come into our land and when he shall tread in our palaces and they and shall we and then shall we rise, raise up against them seven shepherds uh, and eight principal men. 
All right. So awesome. The good stuff there. Uh, verse eight, I want to jump down to. So five and eight. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentile in the midst of many as a lion among the beasts of the forest and a young lion among the flocks of the sheep, who, if he go forth, both treadeth down and tear in pieces and none can deliver. And now we've read that before, but I want to just, I'm going to read it all today. I want to emphasize that area. The Messiah has come <clears throat> and will come. The Messiah will come. And we began kind of uh, expressing, explaining how that the Messiah, Yeshua, who is God, who is the uh, expression of God, <clears throat> In the flesh, on the earth, he's still God. He, he never lost being God. He was both God and he was man in the same place. That confuses people, but it is the truth. He uh, he he had the capability and he had the authenticity and the authority to be both God and man. And in doing that, he saved us. In doing that, he made a way for us to come into salvation. So we, we're excited about God. I don't know what else we can say about that. We're excited about God and what that means for us. So I encourage you to stay excited about who we're talking about. Now, this one is also the one who they're going to come after. He's the one that they're going to smite. He's the one that is going to be hated. They're all, and even Israel, are supposed to be looking forward to him coming. And their idea of him looking forward to him coming is that he's going to restore all things. Uh, and that restoring all things is what is uh, quite wonderful to them, even in the book of Ezekiel and other places where he talks about that he's going to restore and then he's going to send them forth. And they're going to eventually go out and spoil the enemy and the adversary and uh, Magog and Agog and go into uh, Ezekiel goes deep, man, chapter 38. <clears throat> Ezekiel, I mean, he breaks us some stuff down for us so we will have a better understanding <laughs> that that when Jesus comes again, which he has come and he will come, <clears throat> he's going to bring forth uh, the delivery and the deliverance that was promised from the very beginning. That God, although he, he sees man and he knows our ins and outs, our going forth, he even knows our he knows our, how to separate our today from our yesterday, you know, understanding our yesterday and our tomorrow. You know, he has it all. Uh, he still sent his Messiah. He still sent his, his, his anointed one, his Jesus, right? And it's so key that we recognize the, the grace of God in that. We know by grace are we saved, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself, but it's the gift of God. We know that, but I don't think we can fully appreciate it if we don't understand the, 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 uh, and, and almost the chronicle of travels uh, that Jesus has brought forth. When we talk about Jesus um, coming forth on, as a man on, out of Mary, we have to understand that that Messiah of God, that Messiah, the specific anointed one Messiah, not just one of the anointed ones, but the anointed one, has been so present and shown up at the right time in the lives of different children of God to be their rescuer, to be their deliverer, to be their hope. Hallelujah. So it is important that that's at the center of your understanding about who is this Messiah to me. Well, you need to understand that to start with. All right. Now, uh, in today's lesson, uh, we want to also make sure we're clarifying this aspect of him. When I say he comes, has come many times, I want you to remember a couple of things. One, we saw him show up in the nature of or in the flow of the king of Salem or the king of peace, Shalom, Melchizedek, right? Uh, when Abraham was fighting for Lot and against the, the Plains War and the War of the Plains, and when Sodom and others were all taken, but the issue was Abraham's nephew was also taken. And uh, at that point, Abraham, uh, let me say chapter 14 of Genesis. Uh, yeah. Abraham says, OK, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to participate in any reward that the king of Sodom or, you know, the connection. I don't want any reward from you. I really delivered you all I fought the enemies because of my nephew, really not because of you. So he came and he got his nephew out, but he met along the way Melchizedek, 
in chapter 14 of Genesis. So let's go there for a quick moment. All right. And uh, the king of uh, chapter 14, verse 17 of Genesis. Go with me there. Uh, 14 and 17. All right. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after return from the slaughter of Kedor Laomer and the king uh, that were with him at the valley of Shavit, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, or Melech Sedek, right? Melech Sedek, which means uh, king, Melech, and Sedek means uh, righteousness, right? Uh, but they interpret it for it because he's the king of righteousness. Righteousness, they call him king of Salem. Brought forth bread and wine and was the priest of the who? Most high God. Priest of the most high God. All right. The priest brings the what? Bread. Look at this. Bread and the wine. Does that bread and wine remind you of a celebration we do in the modern era? Or hopefully it reminds you of the uh, the uh, communion or the Eucharist uh, celebration that we have, which is also tied to the Peshach or the Passover. And they all tie into the, the, the understanding that there is this deliverer, this deliverer that shows up. Okay, so this deliverer, this idea of the king of Salem or the Melech Sedek or Melchizedek, it depends on the pronunciation you want to go with and understand. Um, he blessed him and said, verse 19, uh, blessed be Abraham of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be Abraham of the most high God, who is the who is the most high God as possessor of heaven and earth, not Abraham. Just be clear in your reading context. And blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand, and he gave him tithes of all. All right. And uh, so we should stop there for a moment. When uh, Abraham received and made this connection to, Mel to Melchizedek, the one who came with the bread and the wine, my God. He came and experienced the fact that this priest of God, hallelujah, hallelujah, I'm excited about it. This high priest of God showed up and revealed to him that there was a great blessing upon him. That's why you are victorious. Wait a minute, Pastor Gordon, what are you getting at? We need to understand that our victories in God should always be understood and connected to in our thoughts and in our prayers to the fact that God is with us and he's on our side. That God with us is greater than the world against us. The old saying, it's not actually a scripture, but it is proven throughout scripture, that God with us is greater than the world against us. I definitely want to encourage you to remember that God with us, God with us is greater than the world against us. You know, in the New Testament, you have Jesus in John 4 saying, greater is he that is in thee than he that is in the world. He's telling his disciples that I'm going to give my Holy Spirit and you'll know what's true because you'll have the Holy Spirit, which will give you discernment that spirit of me that'll be inside of you, my Holy Spirit, it's my Holy Spirit, my spirit I'm giving you, that's going to be your guidance. That will be your direction. So um, at this point in Genesis 14, we see Abram, or Ab yeah, Abram at this time, still his name, is uh, blessed to be victorious against these kings, all right? Uh, the five kings, if I remember all of the story, five of the kings that were fighting and had captured Sodom. And then the king of Sodom in verse 21 said to Abraham, give me the people who you brought, because Abraham Abram, I'm sorry, had captured the people who were taken captive, you know, because when they were uh, doing war back then, a lot of times they would take prisoners of war or take people to be slaves because they can use them, work them, or sell them, right? <clears throat> but Abram got them all back. So the king says, bring me those people who you got out, all the people you saved, you know, uh, and, and, and take goods. Let me give you some goods. Let me give you some things. Let me give you some rewards. Let me give you some, some, uh, some victuals or, you know, some food, some this, some clothes, some, some items, some trinkets, you know. And then Abram said to king of Sodom, I'm sorry, 
I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord. I have promised before God. I said, I make an oath. You bless me, God, and I'll honor you. All right. How many of us have done that? And you said, God, you bless me, and I'll honor you. And what we must learn to do is not make an oath and break it. Abraham, in the face of being challenged with the idea of, in a sense, being bribed or saying, hey, let me reward you. Let, the king of, of Sodom is saying, let me give you a reward. And Abraham said, no, I don't want your rewards. See, there comes a times in our lives when you have to be able to reject the enemy's trinkets. Realize that the best blessings only come from God himself. Yeah, that's the only way. The best way is to do it God's way. And knowing the type of uh, culture that the king of Sodom, Sodom I'm sorry, uh, was uh, associated with, he doesn't want to be connected to that. Here's the thing about that. The scripture tells us, touch not, taste not, handle not the unclean thing in, in the Psalms. Why is he saying that? Don't connect yourself to evil. Don't tie yourself to things that are not of God. You know, because the enemy will use you being tied to those things to manifest perversion in your thoughts, perversion in your mind. And you'll get to the point where you'll forget who it is who brought you over. You'll get to the point where you're trusting in your, your uh, things, your money, you know, your, your uh, ways, uh, your friends, uh, all those things. Uh, and you'll forget that it is God that brought you over. You'll forget that is God, that is your hope and your deliverance. So be careful in, in receiving goods or taking rewards uh, from those who are not of God. So what does he say? Let's go back. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand uh, unto the Lord and the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, and I will not take from a thread, from a thread to a shoe latch, a shoelace. I'll just say shoelace for our case. All right. And I will not take anything that is yours or thine. I don't want anything you have lest thou should say, I have made Abram rich. I don't want you to be able to say in any way that you are the reason I'm doing well, but I want to always be clear that my blessing or what the reason I have a blessing is because God has blessed me. So I, I touch not, I taste, I taste not, I handle not the unclean thing. All right, so keep that in mind. When you're in some, those circumstances where the enemy tries to tempt you to say, hey, they can give you this and give you that, but is it of God? No, well, then don't take it, all right? And I said Psalms, that should be in uh, 2 Corinthians. I'll make sure to tell you, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm thinking about something else. All right, so keep that in mind. That's touch not, taste not, handle not. All right, so Abram refuses that, but he does accept and participate in the great blessing that the Mel Mel Melech Sedek or Melchizedek does give. Why? Because the priest is bringing the bread and the wine, the celebration of the covering of the anointed one, the celebration of the covering of the anointed one. Then we see Melchizedek uh, arrive or being, being better analytically clarified to us in the book of Hebrews, right? In chapter seven. So let's look at Hebrews chapter seven. So go now you're at the front of the Bible in Genesis. Now you're going to jump almost to the rear of the Bible. So Hebrews, right? Chapter seven. Now it's important that we understand Melchizedek to comprehend the relationship. All right, so verse chapter seven, verse one. For this Melchizedek, uh, king of Salem, Salem or Shalom, you, the S should be a sheen in the Hebrew word. The letter should be a sheen. And a sheen is actually pronounced with an SH tone. So it's Shalom, which we know as peace. All right, priest of the most high God, who Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. So whom Abram, or Abraham now, uh, gave a tenth of all, of all, being interpreted king of righteousness, that's correct interpretation, because it is Sedek, um, and after he also the king of Shalom, or that is, which is king of peace. All right, so that we know who this Melchizedek is, king of peace, king of righteousness, right? And then verse three is the money verse, without father, without mother, without descendants, or descent without uh, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto who? The son of man. He is the image of, that was the spirit of, that was the nature of, that was the expression of the 
son of God abideth in a priest continually, forever. That is eternally. Continually is a choice use, but it's eternally. All right. So uh, we olam in, is in, Egypt, uh, in the Hebrew. All right. So son of God. Melchizedek is an expression of son of God. I don't know why people can't get that and still argue about this. It's right there. He is an expression of the son of God. What are the key elements? He never had a father. He didn't have a mother. He had no beginning. He had no ending. Then he's God. He is God. All right. So this Melchizedek showed up in Genesis. This Melchizedek shows up in in, in, um, uh, in the life of the son of God, as the son of God. What did I say? The Messiah has come and he will come. The Messiah shows up in various times in the life cycle of the people of God. Why is he doing this? What is going on with this Messiah? Finally, we see him uh, in the big model that we know about in the New Testament period, right? In the uh, 4 BC, 3 BC, 4 BC range, uh, where in, in uh, Jerusalem, born in a manger, comes, he's born of a woman, born of Mary, uh, Miriam or Mary. And he is the model. Uh, he is it. He shows himself again, God, no beginning, no true ending. Jesus has a beginning. He has a beginning day. But the Christ, the Messiah, the one who is the spirit living inside of him, never had a beginning. He is Yahweh. He is his own beginning. He's just expressing himself in these different time periods as is needed. At that time, he came to bring the communion to Abram. So that's an awesome, awesome, awesome thing. The Messiah has come. The Messiah will come. All right. Now, uh, let's go back now to Micah, all right? Amika Yahoo, if you remember the uh, actual Hebrew pronunciation. All right. Um, so we know that he's going to come out of Bethlehem. We're going back to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, uh, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that, sh that shall be ruler in Israel. All right. And it goes on again to express he's eternal. And right after that, and after the semicolon, who's going forth has been from the ancient times, right? And from eternal times, ol olam, right? Everlasting, from ancient and from everlasting. All right, now uh, uh, let's go down to verse four. All right, five and four, breaking this mic down a little bit more. And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord. He shall stand and feed uh, in the strength of the Lord. I spoke about this. He will stand in place. He will feed. He will be the abundance. He will feed his people. But today we want to do just a little bit more breakdown in that and understanding what that functionality looks like. When he says he will stand, is the word in the Hebrew, Ahmad. I know we're using that word as names now, uh, naming boys Ahmad. It means to stand, right? But in the context of the conversation, it actually, uh, th this, this word is pointing to him as a Messiah being the one who stands up, all right? He's the one who stands up against what? Whatever, the, whatever needs to be stood up against. You know, he's the one who resists whenever the trouble rises. He's the one who won't let the enemy tear you down. He's the one that holds up uh, the, the, the banner of the Lord, who holds up the truth, who holds up the reality that God is going to be on our side and that God will defend us from our adversaries because he is our hope and our desire. There's a scripture in Isaiah uh, that we're familiar uh, with. Well, it, it says, so it's a very important scripture in my opinion. It says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard or a resistance, a stalwart, um, a, a wall against it, all right? That, what an awesome word that is. The Lord will lift up a wall. The Lord will lift up a resistance. The Lord will not allow the enemy to overcome us. Uh, even though he comes in like a you know raging or roaring lion, the Lord will lift up a wall 
and a, a resistance against them. That's similar to the idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about this Messiah working where he will stand. This Messiah will stand up. Number two, this Messiah, this word stand in context also should be understood to mean he will stand up for you in your, what's the right word I want to say? Really, it's your marriage. He will be your best man. Who? The Messiah? The Messiah is going to be your, the best man in your marriage to himself. Oh, my goodness. Look at God. Look at these different roles he's playing. Kind of sounds like Eddie Murphy playing some of the roles he plays, right? He plays two or three roles in the same movie, right? All right. Here's God saying, I'm going to play the role of the one who teaches you, shows you, and feeds you, stands for you. Watch this. Then I'm going to, show, I'm going to stand up for you and keep you uh, uh, on the right track. You know, I'm going to defend you. I'm going to keep you on the right track. And stand as a witness that you are honorable to marry, right? When it comes to your heavenly father. So as your best man, I do stand and bow even on your behalf. Look at him, look at him, look at him, look at him. All right. So standing up for you like a best man, the weirdness or the strangeness that I said, he's really standing up for your, his marriage, your marriage to him is because well, who are you marrying? Well, you're marrying God, right? Let's go to Ephesians chapter five for just a minute. Go to Ephesians chapter five. I'm trying to uh, be timely, guys. I just want to make sure that we wrap this up in at least a bow we can say we feel okay about wrapping it up with. And there's more to it, okay? Uh, I am not completing this whole analysis, but it, it, this is a good, good kickoff. All right, so he says it so we can get it like this. Um, Ephesians chapter five. Uh, verse 22, wives, submit unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So you see the analogy, all right? The, 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 the church is analogous to the wife, and Christ is analogous to the husband, okay? Uh, and is the Savior, and he is the Savior of the body. He is the Savior of the the body, the body of Christ, just reference, okay? So that is what he is saying. He is the savior of the church. He's the savior of the believers. Okay, now with, with that, we got a comfort level with that. Then we can move on and say, okay, but wait a minute. He's the one I'm marrying then, right? I am marrying, gender in the flesh doesn't matter, by the way, anybody who's getting confused about that. All right, gender in the flesh is irrelevant. This is a spiritual marriage. All right, now, um, th therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands and everything. Okay, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Here's the next part. That, like, And I teach this all the time when I talk to couples. It's like, first of all, if you're going to be a husband, you have to be a man who's willing to go to the cross for your wife. Because that is the model that Jesus gave as what the husband is analogous to Christ or Christ is analogous to the husband. And that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present to himself, freeze. He might present to himself a glorious church. So he's the one who's preparing the church like the best man, like the friend, like the one who's the witness, the preparer. And then he's the one who's actually getting married. Look, for he, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, because the body of Christ is the church. So men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Look at God. Look at God showing us how we're supposed to sacrifice and relate to the relationship we have with our husband, wives, and then husbands ought to have to, their wives and their wives ought to have to their husband because the necessity of what's needed between us is like that as Christ and the church. Okay, good, good, good. Here's Messiah showing up to cleanse. The Messiah is showing up. He's standing up for the body of Christ. Next word, he will stand and feed. Back to Micah chapter five. Four, and verse number four, he shall stand and feed. This word feed is the Hebrew word rah. 
ra ra ah. Are you two two syllables even though it's like R A A H or it is related to the word R O I Y R O I Y ro i. This is a word when you hear the word Yahweh ro i. The Lord is my shepherd. All right, ro i. It is the idea of I'm seeing or seeing to you. So he will stand and he will see and see to you. All right. That's what a shepherd does. A shepherd does not go to sleep and just leave the sheep out. The shepherd sees and sees to the feeding, the caretaking of the sheep. There is the Lord again. He's shown up Yahweh. Hallelujah. He keeps proving it over and over again. If you if you would take time that you keep seeing him show you. I'm still here. I will come back and show up. I told you last week, the Lord always shows up for his people, his sheep. He is showing us that he feeds, that he does show up. He is the one that gives us power. The Messiah comes to bring us power. Uh, he brings his power, avail makes it available and shows that he's there to, to come upon or bring his anointing against any thing that is evil, that works evil, uh, that is designed to destroy the sheep of God. He comes that the sheep of God are set free. Hallelujah. This is who we are dealing with. That's why we recognize him so greatly as our great Messiah. He is our great deliverer. He is that fighting force that can't be resisted by any enemy because he brings the anointing and the righteousness of God. Hallelujah to his name. So then Next part. Here we go. Next part. Then he's working on then the feeding is building you up so you can be like him. If you go down to verse eight, Micah five, eight, he says, and and the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many peoples as a lion among beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep. And he breaks that down. That, that Let's not confuse the idea of the, the flock of God being sheep with the analogy that the that the Lord Yahweh is pouring through Micah or Micah right now. What he's saying is like the sheep can't resist the lion. They can't fight a lion. A lion can overcome them and get them. Well, that's what God will make his people Israel into. They will be Ari, Ari. They will be the lion that those in the forest can't resist. You know, because they are Ariel, the lion of God. That's why. So then Jesus is also then referenced in this manner to clarify who he really is. Let's go here. Let's go here. Uh, Revelation chapter five. Almost, guys. We're almost there. Hopefully you're gathering, taking this in. Don't get lost. Don't start wandering. Keep your mind focused on what we're talking about. This great Messiah that we have that has come and will come even in your personal life as he will in the long mega picture against the, the adversary. All right, chapter five of Revelation, verse number two, five and two. And I saw a great, saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to be, to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look even at it. Look thereon. They can't even look at the book. It's too powerful to look at the book. All right. And I wept much because no man was found worthy. Now, this is John, you know, Apostle John. He's, the, he's, 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 he's writing as the Holy Ghost, God's Spirit, is showing him these visions in heaven. All right. And I wept much because no man was worthy to open the book, uh, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, weep not. Behold the lion. Uh-oh, there's the lion. Behold the lion, Ari, of the tribe of Judah. Where? Out of Judah he's coming. You remember that? He's coming out of Judah. Judah, Ephrata, Jerusalem and Ephrata. Even though you're even you're small, but out of you will come the leader. Who You will come the ruler of Israel. All right. So let's read the rest of this. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David, son of David. All right, there you go. Um, have prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. There it is. There is the Messiah showing up again in that way. He's showing up with might. He's showing up with power. He's showing up to release what needs to be released in order to vanquish the enemies of heaven. And he will vanquish those enemies of heaven. 
He will overcome those enemies of heaven. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 19. He says important words here. Verse 11. Uh, verse 11, 19. Uh, no, I should read verse 9. You all bear with me to read verse 9 up to 11. All right, so because 11 is important. and Oh, yeah, so awesome. All right. And he said unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage. Back to the marriage. All right. Of the but call to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These say, these are true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See that thou do it not. This is the angel, by the way, talking to John. That's the reason why John is doing that. And the angel said, uh -uh, Don't worship me. I'm an angel. All right. I am a fellow servant and of the brethren that have the testimony of Jesus Christ uh, and do have the testimony of Jesus worship God. So you put a semicolon in there. They did that to clarify. I'm just, I got, I, God is my savior too. You worship, not me. Don't worship me because I'm showing you this stuff. You worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw prophetic words coming and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. Oh, he's going to judge. Remember that? They're going to smite the judge. Okay. All right. His eyes are as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name was called, is called the Word of God. There it is. There it is. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and God was the word. And we beheld the glory of him, the glory of the only begotten of the son, only begotten of the father. All right. And the armies which were in heaven fell, uh, followed upon, upon um, him, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. You remember in other scriptures we read that wearing that kind of garment is something that belongs to the saints of God sign that belongs to the saints of God. So that would be, if we're not, if we're not off the earth, if we're still on the earth at that time, is, is one thing. But if we're already in heaven, we'll probably be, or potentially be among those riding behind the Messiah on white horses. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with he might, with it he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he shall tread, the, tread it, and he treadeth the winepress of fierceness, and the wrath of the almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So you really now can see the Messiah being again fully uh, manifested and his glorious, uh, a glorious attire, his glory garb, glorious garb, showing how mighty he is and who he is, and that he's coming against the earth rulers, and that he will eventually place them in their place. And in, in a couple of more verses down there, you're going to see what happens to them, and it's not good at all. But uh, you know, he does have to rule. He's a king. He's a judge. King of kings. He is. He's the priest that we saw back in Genesis. He's the priest that is being referred to in in Hebrews. He is this holy Messiah of God. I just want to draw this, draw this to you. And he has all these things and he's designing you and I to walk like he walked, to, to believe like him, to flow like him, to carry on in his same manner. The last verse I want to read to you is this, and I know I'm a little long, so make sure we close this out today. So just give me just a little patience if you don't mind. Uh, Romans chapter eight, verse 29. God showing you, he's making you in his image. He's showing you, he's making you to be like him. This is what he's doing in our spirit. Verse number 29. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. If you know, if you know Jesus, you know God called you to the truth. You know it was a calling that brought you there. And, and whom he called, them he also justified. He made you righteous. He straightened you out from the inside out. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. See, he also gives us glory. Just like he's glorious, he makes us glorious. He makes us wonderful. He makes us like him. He makes us to be honored. He makes us to do great exploits, just like he did great exploits. He makes us to be victorious. The victory in you and the victoriousness of God in you is due to the fact that he is working it out in you. 
trust him, walk in him, be faithful to the word that is him. He is the word of God and he will bless you. Now, God bless you all. Pray this blesses you as it blessed me. And amen.